Congress. I just have saw way too many people that frankly don't know what they're talking about in Congress. I'm not going to mince any words about it. I'm going to have a great time tonight, and I, I encourage a lot of questions. I just stepped off a plane uh, from Taipei, Taiwan. I haven't slept in 36 hours. That's the way business has to work when you're working in international trade. Got evidence right here. Here's the Taipei paper. I also went to Penang. I went to Bangalore. Um, Shanghai, and all around the world, more than 24,000 miles I just traveled in the last two weeks. This country has some serious structural problems, and we need to get to addressing them. And one of the problems that I see in the American public in particular is a lack of understanding of what we're really up against. When I go to Shanghai and I see cranes all over the place, I see nuclear plants being popped up all over the place, they're driving the cost of energy down, they're stressing out that their economy is only going to grow 7.5%. Their urban unemployment rate is 4.1% in Shanghai versus what is it here? What, 16, 17% in San Joaquin County? And that's the liar number. You know, that's, that's not the, the, the real number. This is what we're up against. We're up against guys that are competitive. They're competitive on all kinds of levels. When you look right on the front page of this paper, they're telling us why they cannot put beef into the Taiwan market. You know, they, they were all up on Twitter about the, uh, about the mad cow problem years ago. And as soon as that one finally went away, they came up with another hormone problem. They use our own court systems and our own environmental talk against us in the foreign markets. I see this all the time, every time I'm there. We need people that know what they're talking about, that have been there, that have talked to the CEOs, that have talked on all kinds of levels, and I have. I haven't, I'm not just talking about trade. I've done tens of millions of dollars of trade. I've had three successful startups in a row, more than a billion dollars in market capitalization. I'm not running on this to make money. Trust me, if I get elected, I'm going to lose a lot of money. But I just get frustrated by the way politics are done today. It is not the way that this country should run. The premier of China is a geologist, not a lawyer. Think about it. Uh, I'm going to have uh, Jeff Denham is not here, but his campaign manager, Ethan Kirk, is. I'm going to have him come up and give a little speech for uh, Jeff. And... Uh, for three minutes. We're not going to have him take any questions because you really need to have the candidate for the questions. But come on up. We're going to start with general questions for all candidates. We'll be switching back and forth after that between legislative and congressional. We're going to ask the candidates to please stick to one minute on response so that we can um, get several questions out. First question. Um, we'll start with um, Mr. Amador. We'll just start with the A. <laughs> we'll start on this side with congressional candidate. Are you pro-life? And what does that mean to you? Yes, I am pro. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I am pro life. Um, in fact, the first candidate questionnaire I filled out in this district was the National Right to Life questionnaire. Uh, to me, that means no federal funding for abortions, above and beyond um, kind of what, what it means generally. Um, there should be no federal funding for the practice. That's been the case for a long time since the 1970s. I support the Hyde Amendment, uh, and I would continue that practice. I'm abs is this live? Yeah. Okay, I'm absolutely pro-life. Me and my wife worked um, in crisis pregnancy centers. I wish Ricky Gill would expand more on his pro-life stance. Um, he, he's got quite a background there. You might want to ask him about. Yes, yeah, so I'm very strongly pro-life. Well, I add my amen to every every one of the people up here. They they they've articulated extremely well. I support the Second Amendment. I'll do whatever I can to make sure. And also, um, we, we have to fight back. I mean, we've got to 
not just be content with playing defense and trying to be a great defense. We got to go on offense and make sure that we get greater liberty in, in terms of the liberties that have already been taken away on, on gun rights and um, just continue to push. And we see that the state is all, all over our Constitution. We've seen recently um, on religious liberty, um, you know, they've come in and, and really trying to go after the Catholic Church. We've, it, it's just disgusting what they, they do. Um, and one day, Trust me, they're coming after the First Amendment, and it's all going to be done under their guise of, well, that's not the appropriate way to talk, or that's not the right kind of gun to own, or, you know, you just got to watch this. You can't really do that with your property. You know, they need to uh, be voted out of office, and we need to push back and go on offense. Okay. I, w I would echo the sentiment of lot that was just said. I would say, and it suggests further, the Second Amendment is a vitally important part of the Constitution. As I mentioned in my remarks, I view it through the prism of self-defense, as most of you do. I would just add a point about context. There's so many decline, um, there's such a decline, rather, in resources given to public safety um, for whatever reason that I think the Second Amendment is, is kind of breathed new purpose into the Second Amendment. Um, and that's, that's very important. So um, I, I think there are things that a federal legislator could do uh, to advance the cause of the Second Amendment. Uh, it is about making sure that this is um, a very important and protected right. Um, as Mr. Berryhill said, it's about hunting and recreation and making sure that space is available um, for those pursuits. Open carry legislation, uh, you would be <coughs> being a very compelling advocate in Congress on these issues. Okay, for the, for the next question, actually before the next question is asked, I want to make a general comment to the audience that a number of the questions... System of education. Yeah, in the classical sense, is education a right? The answer is no, it's earned. But, um, in, like, um, uh, Senator, uh, so, Assembly Man, <laughs> very well said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, K through 12 is, is, you know, not going anywhere, and it, it, it's what we have to fund, and it will be funded. Um, the one thing I want to say about education, though, and what is surprising is the breakdown of the family has had a greater impact on the education of our youth than almost anything else. We can look to the schools and teachers and this kind of thing, but if you look at a young man today and say, what's the number one determinant on what his education level is? It's whether well, their dad's in the home. It's not what great teachers they have or what school district they went to or anything like that. It's, it's of our mom and dad married, staying together, and raising their kids. That's the number one determinant to that, uh, to, to that kid's education level. And we need to get real with what we're doing to our society when 70% of our kids in some of our communities are growing up without um, you know, a dad in the home. I tell you what, there isn't there hardly anything you can do in the way of a government program or anything that is going to make that situation any better. And we've we just got to be honest about that. We can, we can talk about all kinds of programs, but we're just going to be throwing money down, uh, down the toilet unless we understand what, why the family is the way the family is. To answer your question, education is a pursuit. It's grounded in the individual and determination and tenacity to achieve. Um, I would just cite my experience here um, fighting for this very concept. When I was on the California State Board of Education, a very meaningful debate uh, transpired around the high school exit exam. And there was a temptation six, seven years ago to relax this requirement. And there was a school of thought out there where people thought we could stipulate, mandate a 100% graduation rate, that a high school diploma was an entitlement, and it's not. We fought for a high school exit exam to give meaningful, uh, to give meaning to a high school diploma, and I think that you know, informs where I stand on all these issues. Um, I do agree with uh, some statements that were made here on choice and competition in public education. We've got to break down the monopoly that a lot of these entrenched interests have in public schools. Kids are being put at the back burner. It's unfortunate. They, unfortunately, are the one uh, interest group that doesn't have an organized lobby in Sacramento. And, and that's unfortunate. I think it speaks to a bigger issue. Uh, and I have the experience to take this fight um, where it needs to be taken. Thanks. Now we're going to pass on the same question. We're going to pass the mic to uh, Mr. Jaffrey and then move. Yeah, I was uh, raised Plymouth Brethren, which is sort of like Amish Mennonite, um, so it's kind of it's kind of conservative. Um, the, uh, the, uh, yeah, how how is that going to guide me? Well, um, I I moved out of that, so that's not what I am. But I do believe faith underlies science. I believe. Faith otherwise, pretty much the 
the entire worldview of how you perceive yourself. Do you believe man is the is the um, one who sets the morality standards, or do you believe God sets the morality standards? And that is a big dividing line between people, and depending on which basis you form your beliefs, um, it has a, a radical difference in how you live your life. And I believe that um, in God, I believe that, um, that, that there is a, a creator that we will answer to one day. And so, no matter what I do, whether it's in public or private, I will give an account for my actions someday. I was raised a, a Sikh in this community, and that informs the high level of tolerance I have for people of all traditions. It's also why I was placed in parochial schools for the better part of my education, whether it was at St. Anne's or Greg knows well, McCollum New River School. So um, I would say it informs uh, much of what a legislator or any good human being does. It gives you um, a barometer for how to hold yourself accountable, uh, to make sure that a promise made is a promise kept. And those are the values that fundamentally guide every action I've taken, not just in the context of this campaign, but uh, as a human being, because um, you know you come into contact with others who have a high expectation of you, and, uh, and, and your faith, I think, is a critical part of keeping uh, keeping that trust. And trust is something that is sorely absent in politics today. And one of the great reasons I'm in this race is that we've had elected leaders around here we barely even knew, let alone trust me. Um, and so my faith underlies much of what I do. Now we'll pass the mic to Mr. Amador and give him an opportunity. Thank you. I was uh, raised and to keep our candidates on their toes. <coughs> We're going to direct this question first to Mr. McDonald. And then we'll pass the mic to, uh, to Mr. Okay. Hill. And then, uh, and then we'll go from Mr. Barry Hill on down the line. So under what circumstances would you vote for a tax or fee increase, if any, if you're elected to office? What circumstance would I? That's a really tough question. Yeah. I, I can't think of uh, any case where I would be voting for tax or fee increases of any kind. I think we have enough money in Washington. I think our problem is, is uh, spending big time. Um, in fact, I think the really dicey issues in Washington, when you look at the, the budget items, I mean, you've got basically military spending, you've got Medicare, Medicare, uh, Social Security, and debt, right? And, and that, you've got a lot of other stuff, but relative to what matters, you've got four huge lines. And we've got to get real about spending. And every time, every time you know, Congress gets together and they have one big um, agreement that they're going to cut spending, they go, oh, we're going to cut a trillion bucks, and by the time you know you hear about it three weeks later, it turns out they cut 20 million bucks or something like that. I mean, it's, just, it's so the whole focus that I will have when I go to Congress is how am I cutting? I, I, I have no interest in raising any tax on anything. I, I just don't see that happening. Greg, to answer your question, I think the priority has to be streamlining government and growing revenue by growing the economy. And that's my overall philosophy. Uh, I'm the only one in this campaign, to my knowledge, you signed the Americans for uh, the ATR pledge, uh, Americans for Tax Reform pledge. I believe that this is not uh, this is not a revenue crisis. This is something that we need to get more efficient with in the public sector, and that's certainly my approach. Uh, two things I would I would cite in addition to that: we need to get back to baseline budgeting in this campaign, uh, and also in the Congress, and that means redefining what a cut means. Right now, a cut is just a slowed increase in Washington, and that is just a paradigm shift that. I wasn't party to and you weren't a party to. The second thing is I, I advocate for a balanced budget requirement. We need to return to that being the norm and not the exception. Um, that's not to say there aren't exemptions in cases of dire national emergencies, uh, Greg, but we can carve that out uh, in a balanced budget requirement and, and, and I'm open to that, but that has to be a high threshold, not just a majority vote in Congress, a supermajority would probably be required. And, uh, I think that's a matter of consensus. Most people would agree to that. Yeah. In fairness to the audience, we're going to ask that you uh, try to keep your answers to 30 seconds or under um, if possible. So this is directed to our two congressional candidates, and we'll start with Mr. Gill first. If Obamacare is not overturned by the Supreme Court, what do you intend to do to repeal the law when you're in Congress? Well, I think there are two routes. One, it has to be repealed, uh, and I would absolutely do so. The second approach is to defund it. 
uh, but I would try the first and exhaust that remedy first, and then uh, we can move on down the course of action. Now, the reason it needs to be repealed also needs to be explained. There was no tort reform in that measure. The lawyers got off scot-free. There's no competition across state lines. It crushes the individual's uh, volition and discretion in our economy. It outstretches the Commerce Clause. But it's a fundamental usurpation by the federal government. And it's another example of overreach. Uh, it's something that I have openly opposed. Uh, it is a crushing mandate, which is going to cost uh, more than it was even initially projected. We know that from the Congressional Budget Office. We simply can't afford it, uh, and it's cheating the next generation. Well, to the extent that you can defund it, I think that's a great idea. One of, one of the problems with Obamacare that is rarely talked about is that it really is a takeover of health care. Basically, what they're doing is they're taking a few large insurance companies and they're turning them into the equivalent of uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, kind of basically government-backed organizations. And um, I, what that is going to do, um, it's going to absolutely kill innovation in the medical business. And that, that is the thing that is so sad. When these statists take over uh, things, the first thing that goes is innovation. Because it's one of those things you can't put a finger on. You can't say, when is an innovation going to happen? But now the government is going to dictate um, what new products come to market, what new drugs come to market. And that is one of the saddest things about it, is we can't point to all those people that are not going to be living 20 years from now as Obamacare starts to come over and become the wet blanket over this entire uh, health care industry. Thank you. Our next questions for the legislative, we're going to... Congress, and we're going to have one more question for our congressional candidates and one more question for our legislative candidates. And uh, you'll have the turn to speak first, Mr. McDonald, on this. Um, what federal programs, if any, will you work uh, to shut down in Congress if you're elected? Well, I think the federal government just does way too much. I think the education department should be outsourced to the states. Done, finished. I mean, there's, there's just an enormous amount of, of federal programs that, that should be uh, shut down. Um, I do believe that the big budget items, though, need to be addressed. And one of the things that I don't like with a lot of people, they, 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 they can give a lot of technical details, even like balanced budget amendment. You know, for 30 years of my life, people have been talking about balanced budget amendment, and it hasn't happened. But yet, when these same people who say they support the balanced budget amendment come up to cut spending, the votes aren't there. They want to put off, you know, with some really complicated thing that you've got to get all the states together and you've got to make all this happen. But when, they're, when their turn comes to vote for a simple cut spending bill, the votes aren't there. When, when we had this budget agreement that just, just went down earlier in the year, when we only had 22 Republicans that sit there and, and fought the hard fight to sit there and say, we're not going to increase the debt limit. This is what I'm talking about. We can't always just have extreme... Yeah, yeah sorry. Greg, I think we need a general sunset law, as Ronald Reagan once admonished us, the closest thing to eternal life on earth is a federal program. So we need to be facing... <laughs> Thank you. You guys laughed on cue. And then uh, the good news is, look, if we had a general sunset law, it would force us to revisit programs that work and separate those from, from, from what don't. To get back to water, because it's partly a federal issue, the peripheral canal is a huge threat, I just want to note for the record, it's taken five years for Jerry McNerney to get on the floor of Congress and denounce the peripheral canal which I find to be an application of responsibility. It's exactly why we cannot talk about exporting our water. We have outsourced and exported our congressmen to the Bay Area for a long time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, our last. This election is really a historic opportunity to finally send a really representative voice um, to Washington. Uh, what we've had for the past six years is a congressman, but we have not had a representative. You know, my opponent has an F rating from the Farm Bureau, and this is an ag district. He has not fought for choice in public education. I will. I want to fight for the next generation of taxpayers, even those who aren't even unborn who have been mistreated. We've got to curtail this regulatory climate. We've got to bring this economy back. But we as a people in this, in this district have the dignity to represent ourselves. And that's what we are testing, that proposition. When you look at me, I want you to see a reflection of you, and I'd be honored to be your voice in Congress. Thanks so much. I think we need to talk about real issues like energy. Um, every cent per kilowatt hour is 25,000 jobs to the state of California. We've got to set metrics and say we're going to drive the price of electricity down to 5 cents, 10 cents, whatever that number is.
But that creates jobs. We've got to repeal Sarbanes-Oxley. We've lost two million jobs over 10 years. One thing I, I don't hear out of a lot of politicians is because they don't work in industry, they don't actually see what is killing us. Actually, you know what? Even our interest rates that have been dropping over 30 years is actually killing our economy. I can't possibly talk to you about everything that in, in 30 seconds about it. Yeah, and you're exactly right, John. You can't close in 30 seconds, but let me just say this. I want to thank all of you for coming out here tonight.